Hey. Yeah, I got class today. Now on mute. Okay, now theoretically. Oh, seven participants. Okay, good. So hopefully those people can see things. If you can't send me a text message or something, I think we're on business here. All right. And let me get rid of this. So uh, Ghost GNS has been infecting devices, uh, mostly in another country, not in America. But 100,000 devices infected. This has happened several times that people infect a ton of them. And Ghost DNS attacks, uh, there was another one with a similar name. These are ones that change your DNS resolvers in your router or on your computer. In this case, I think it's routers. And then it sends all your traffic to an unauthorized DNS resolver so that the bad guy can control it and change the entries at will which makes it easy for them to redirect you to phishing versions of every site when they get ready. So they can just do nothing for a while until you are lulled into thinking everything's fine and then one day change the Bank of America to a fake Bank of America and you would never know. Unless it was HTTPS, which almost everything is these days, which it seems like would, if everything was really HTTPS, this kind of attack wouldn't really do much good at all. Um, but... I guess they will find some banks that aren't HTTPS and target them or something like that. But anyway, you can redirect traffic to some extent there. And here's Google is apparently trying to increase their Chrome extension security. Uh, so they're not going to let them use obfuscated code anymore. Uh, that would be nice. This is an easy thing to do when you're doing instant response on a hack server, which I've done a few times. Um, you look for code you can't read. Code that you, can, you can put code in, you can write JavaScript that builds code letter by letter from a string. And so it just is a bunch of uh, addition string calculations instead of being able to read it. And you can use base 64 and a bunch of other ways to do it. And all that stuff is just so that people can't copy your code and reuse it on another website. But criminals, of course, use it for malware to fool antivirus engines and fool analysts. It's a really weak defense, a really weak um, way to protect your code because all you have to do is run it, uh, copy the web page, and modify the code to stop halfway through and run it until it unpacks and then look at it. So it's very easy to de-obfuscate it. But anyway, Google wants people to quit using it for legitimate code, which is good. It's very easy to detect. And if they don't put it in uh, the official extensions, that would probably make it safer. Anyway, let's see if there's anything else fun to look at. Um, Yeah, none of these seem that exciting. Oh, yeah, this one's interesting. We now have UEFI root kits. These things were considered science fiction. So um, uh, this happens to people a lot. One, off, one question I get often from students is, I got infected with malware, so I wiped the OS completely and reinstalled it. That should get rid of it, right? And I say, well, yeah, unless somebody would actually write a BIOS root kit. No, you probably never see any of those, but now they're out. So the UEFI rootkit would live on the chips on the motherboard and reinstalling the whole OS or physically replacing the hard drive will not fix it. So that's out there. The, the, no, the, uh, the, the, what they used to call the BIOS, now they call the UEFI. It's code in a special chip on the motherboard, not the hard drive. It's the code used during startup. And the extensible firmware update is the replacement for the BIOS. The BIOS is the really old one that does the power on self check and hunts for the floppy and the CD and the hard drive until it finds a way to boot up. And the UEFI is the modern one that has more options. It's like the with the yeah. Read only memory. Yes, except nothing's really read only anymore. So it is, it's some kind of a chip on the motherboard which can be reflashed. And it can be reflashed from software and apparently can be reflashed from malware. And that's, I know, has been true for a while. Um, so, but as far as the problem with these things and why they never have been popular is it depends on your hardware. So you can't just write a virus that infects every Windows machine. You'd have to write a virus that infects these particular models of Dells or something. And that's why I actually always expected this to hit Mac people earlier because Macs have a huge install base of exactly identical hardware and PCs do not. So logically, they would be the easier one for this kind of attack, but I think this one still attacks uh, PCs. In the same vein, um, Apple has a device enrollment issue, which uh, I don't remember the details of this one. I know there is a thing called um, side loading for apps, where you can load apps that do not come from the Apple store if you agree to it. It's a, it involves social engineering. Yeah, we, we do the, uh, 
uh, app device security, we set up one of these. There are about 14 mobile device management platforms you can get. They're the equivalent of a domain controller for mobile devices. So you put one of these on, then you run an app on every phone and every tablet in your company, and that enrolls them with the master server. And now the master server can limit what apps go on it, erase the corporate data, erase the whole thing, change the password, find it if it gets lost, remote wipe it, all these things that you might need to do. Um, but in order to do that, um, you can also have special company apps that you write that are not public, that never go in the Apple store, and you give it permission to trust your publisher. And you, if you can get someone to just click yes to them, like a text message, they can trust the publisher, and there's nothing in that message that normal humans can understand. So they'll just click yes, and after that you put in an app that never went through the approval process. And this is a known vulnerability in Apple, one of the very few. It, in, you do have to trick someone into agreeing to something, but after that you can install apps that could be malicious. Yeah, yeah, this is another one, not the one I just described. This is a different folder building. I forget the details of this one. A uh, Coinbase is in San Francisco. I've been trying to get them to give talks here, but I, they're all too busy making piles of money, I think. They're the most, uh, they're, as far as I can tell, they're by far the most legitimate cryptocurrency exchange in the world, which is sort of like being the most legitimate uh, ransomware probably in the world. But anyway, they, they are really serious about, they're trying, they're one of the people that really want to make cryptocurrency legal and respected. And so they're trying to make it a serious financial vehicle and they're trying to comply with all the government's rules as the government tries to figure out what to do about it. And anyway, now they've got, um, some kind of new investment product where you mix several cryptocurrencies together to try to diversify to hopefully lower the risk. Cryptocurrencies are an extremely risky investment, and the typical financial cure for that is diversification. So that might possibly be of some benefit. Anyway, um, everyone tells me that Coinbase is the best of a bad lot. Um, so as cryptocurrency goes, they're probably the least crooked. But it's a very corrupt business right now. Anyway, so I think we're up to the official time. All right, so let's talk about DNS vulnerabilities. Um, so there are various things that can make your DNS server and your, your network vulnerable. You can just set up your DNS wrong, or set up your architecture wrong, or use older vulnerable versions of software and fail to use the extensions. The architecture mistakes were very prevalent, hopefully not that much now. This is before the days of Net Plus and Security Plus. Uh, this is part of what led to that. Um, People used to just typically have one route into this network and one DNS server. And then when it went down, the whole network was down. And that's not so wise. And people gradually learned that you should not have a single point of failure anywhere. You should not be one router that's all essential, one firewall, one power supply, anything like that. Um, so now, typically, um, you can't register a domain, usually without having two DNS servers for the domain. So if one is down, there's another. As a, and you can't your client will try to get you to put two DNS servers in your client. So if one is down, one available, you have another. This is just normally done because DNS is so important. If you lose the ability to resolve DNS, you've lost almost all networking. So here's the old fashioned technique. You would have um, your internal network down here on the left, your internet up there, people are coming in, they hit your firewall, they go to the router, they go to the, the um, DNS, you have two DNS servers, but you only have one firewall and one router there and one internal router. And if any one of those devices goes down, everybody can't reach your DNS server anymore. And that means you're hosed. They can't find your, the addresses of your servers to get to them. So this was common maybe until like 99 or 98 or so. People would set up networks this way and not think about it until they realized that they had to do better. Um, so uh, you can, even if you have multiple servers, multiple routers, multiple cables, if they're all in the same building or in the same city, then you still have a problem because there are citywide disasters like fires and floods and earthquakes. And then you'll wish you had geo location, geo diverse, multiple locations like Google has servers everywhere. So I mean, you could not take down Google with an atomic bomb. If you blew up a whole city, there'd be other cities with a copy of it all or traffic would just go over there. I mean, unless you destroy the whole world, you can't take down a big company like Google or Cloudflare or Yahoo. And that's what you get with geodiversity. Um, I know I met a guy who set up the uh, Hartford 
insurance company network because I was teaching a, a GNA, uh, CISSP class there and we we're talking a lot about this. And he talked about, he said, they wanted to have five nines uptime. Now, five nines uptime is almost never achieved. People promise it a lot, but I don't know anybody that's actually ever achieved it. Like our local five nines hoster is called um, 65 Main or something. A number of Main downtown is a major host. You can be a five nine hosting facility and they went down for four days. <laughs> Amazon went down for four days. Five nines mean you go down five minutes a year. And no matter how many redundant copies of everything you have, almost nobody has ever achieved that. And one, the only company I've ever heard that actually achieved it was Hartford Insurance. And they built everything, they overbuilt everything by a factor of 10. And they had several different server farms in Texas, like 300 miles apart. So when a hurricane got one, it didn't get the other. And they really claim they achieved five nines. But it is real expensive and almost nobody does. And Cloudflare never promised five nines. And I know they went down for about six hours about four years ago, but that would be enough to use up their five nines for a whole century. If they, I think you only promised like four nines is all they're going to get. In fact, I think for the free customers, I don't even think they promised that. Hey, can you pull that shade a bit? It's shining light in my eyes. If you can find a pull chain on the side or something. Yeah, good. Great. Bring that down a bit. Thanks. Anyway, so the, uh, the root of DNS is, of course, important. If that were to go down, then within a day or two, we'd all begin to lose connectivity. So they have these 13 root servers, each of which themselves is a huge cluster. So there are many servers cooperating in that. Anyway, so here's common mistakes. One common mistake is that you have one total DNS server, which includes both internal records, which are not really intended for public viewing, and your external records, like your web server and email server, which are all on the same device. That's not a good idea because if your device is serving the world as your public web, as your public DNS server, then it's getting traffic from everybody. And that makes it likely to get hacked because it's just open to everybody. And therefore, people are likely to get on there and get all the data. So there shouldn't be any data on there. You don't want the whole world to see it. And you probably do have the address of every internal device in DNS also because your local network uses DNS, but you don't really want everybody in the world to see it. So this is uh, the right way to set it up. You should have public DNS servers over here on the right in your DMZ that just have information for the servers in your DMZ, the public servers, web and, and email. And then you should have another location with the authoritative servers for your internal network somewhere else, which is not going to be used by normal people trying to reach you. So these, these servers on top left are not authoritative. Or excuse me, they are authoritative. The ones on the right are not. Uh, let, me, let me get this right. They are authoritative for your internal network if you have public resources there but you have different data on each of these and you restrict them that's the idea uh, this is of course more expensive you have two locations you have more servers and this is why there are products like microsoft small business server which i think i've heard it still exists that has everything you need all in one box which is a terrible idea from a security point of view domain controller email dns server web server all in one box just what you should absolutely not do <laughs> but of course it's cheaper and then, of course, there's the problem that you're going to see in several of the projects. Uh, Microsoft is very strange. And uh, this all comes from history. 20 years ago, Microsoft was the bully in the room. They didn't care about the rules. They didn't care about the RFCs, the technical specifications or anything. They just did anything they wanted and said, everybody has to do what we say because they really were 99% of the desktops. So a bunch of eggheads would do a mathematical study and decide how DNS should work. Microsoft would say, yeah, your opinion has been noted and we're going to do whatever we want anyway. So they programmed their clients to automatically configure addresses with DHCP. And then every time they do, they ask the root servers on the internet for a reverse lookup to see if somebody's already using that address. So they, they address a, auto configure a local address like 192.168.1.101, which cannot be put on a public server. And then they send unnecessary requests up to the internet asking if somebody's using that address for a public server. When they should know, RFC 1918, those are private addresses, but they don't. Microsoft just didn't care. It is such a huge problem. It creates a huge amount of traffic and a huge amount of processing time left. There are special servers just to handle all this garbage traffic created by all the millions of Windows devices in the world for no reason at all. It's nuts and it's been that way for 20 years and you'll see it in the projects you can set it up and you'll see these ridiculous queries asking this stupid question is somebody put a public server on 192.168.02 well of course they haven't they can't 
And you should not, this Microsoft operating system should know better than to keep asking that stupid question, but it doesn't even now for some reason. And you will go through, if you do the extra credit projects, the way you have to turn this off in the Microsoft operating system is amazingly difficult. There's not even a checkbox somewhere to turn it off. You have to go through a lengthy process to block this garbage. It's very strange, but Microsoft was originally a very bad citizen on the internet, like AOL. They just made everybody hate them by just being rude and in the way and making trouble. They reformed a lot after that, but their DNS architecture seems to have never received much of an update. So in Sierra Server 2008, sending all these stupid things to in-address Arbor, asking stupid questions about 192, 168, when the answer is obviously no. And um, anyway, that's the game of that. You can configure local servers to not pass on those stupid queries so you don't bother people outside your company with these stupid things. Uh, that's one way to do it. And another thing, by the way, which is a good policy anyway, is to not let any of your client machines make direct DNS queries outside your network. You should not let people use public DNS resolvers like OpenDNS and Google DNS and, and 1.1.1.1 at Cloudflare unless you really want to because you probably want to control what people are doing with DNS. If you make them use your local DNS, and then you have one place where you can sniff all the traffic and monitor the traffic and block domains you don't want them going to and all that jazz, whereas if you just let them do DNS resolution everywhere, then lots of, lots of unencrypted information about what your people are doing are flying out of your network going God knows where, and that's not very sanitary. So uh, that's the game. You don't want every server to be recursive. Remember, recursive servers, if you ask them a question, they will, if they don't have the answer in their local database, they will go ask somebody else. Now, normally, that's what you want for like your home router, because you're going to surf the whole internet, and it doesn't know where Yahoo is, it should go find out. But if you're setting up authoritative servers to manage your domain, to go to your servers, there's no reason for them to be recursive, because they are serving incoming traffic, which would only be for your servers. So they should just answer what they know, and anything else they should say, go ask somebody else. I'm not here to help you browse the internet. I'm only here to help you reach my servers. And there's no need, yeah, well, there's no need to waste my bandwidth and processing time helping you find Yahoo when I'm not Yahoo. I'm here to help you find my company. And we, and you, when you want to surf the internet, you have other servers you set up to be recursive servers for your clients. And again, it's, it's an issue of network segmentation where you separate types of traffic into different zones and that makes it much safer because then you know what to look at over here and you know what is anomalous. Um, we're going to do this this Saturday in the uh, uh, 140 class preparing for cyber competitions. These guys are going to be off in the offense competition. I'm going to be doing defense and we're setting up servers to use filtering of the incoming and outgoing traffic to secure them. And so you should have a separation of what goes on on a server. Like typically a server like a web server should never make an outgoing connection to anything. It shouldn't, the only should be browsing the web from that server. It should be taking only incoming connections. And if you do that, it's much easier to enforce that at the firewall and the router and make the network safer. If you let every server have a multiplicity of different kinds of traffic, it's much harder to secure it. Anyway, so that's the game. Uh, your recursive servers you also only serve your clients, your customers, your, your employees, and your customers should have a, a server they can use on the way out but you don't generally offer that service to the whole world. Now, there are a few of them that do, like Google and OpenDNS and Cloudflare's 1.1.1.1, but if you let the whole world use your public recursive server, then they can use it as a vehicle of attack. So if you don't want that happening, you have to introduce extra, more complicated defenses like rate filtering, where you notice if you're getting too many copies of the same query from the same address or something, and block it. That's what you have to do if you run a public server. If you run a private, recursive server just for your own employees, you typically don't have to bother because you don't expect your employees to try to use your server to perform an attack. And uh, usually you can find them and fire them if they're gonna do things like that. Um, so there's a project to find these open resolvers. They're all over the internet. One thing that used to be common 10 or 15 years ago was open SMTP servers where anybody could send email through them and everybody used that to send spam until most of those have been shut down. Uh, but open DNS resolvers are still out there quite a lot, and they're used to amplify um, uh, denial of service attacks. And there's an open resolver project for DNS, and there's a similar one for open NTP servers that let you send queries from anywhere which have a large response. And in both cases, you can use it to amplify attacks. 
CTSF DNS servers were open several years ago, but they closed them by 2016. Um, and you can do the query to find the name servers, and then you can go back to here and check those name servers to see if they're open. That's what I did. And uh, they were open, but now they're closed as of a couple of years ago. Another issue is zone transfers. If you have a DNS server and you want to set up another DNS server just to handle the load and be fault tolerant, it has to copy the data from this server. Now you could just zip it into a file and email it or something, but there is an official protocol just to do it on a regular basis because you want to keep it up to date. And that's a zone transfer that runs over TCP 53. And that's fine, but you usually don't want to let everybody in the world do zone transfers or they can all copy all the data on the server. Now there really shouldn't be anything secret on a DNS server anyway. But because Microsoft automatically registers every machine in DNS, it does have a lot of information that you probably really don't want the whole world to see. Because basically your whole network diagram is in there. So it's considered a poor practice to let everybody have a DNS zone transfer. And North Korea did. North Korea went on the internet. They had unprotected zone transfers at their root domain when they, they came up. So there's, I didn't know this, there's a, someone running a project that automatically does zone transfers for all top level domains every three hours in case anybody makes this mistake and then publishes the results. So you can see the whole map of North Korea's um, top level structure. Yeah. So what does protected zone transfer look like? Is that the password or how does that um, The typical ones just let you restrict uh, what IP addresses can download. It would be more sensible to have a password. As far as I know, the only way to do that is to put like a VPN server in front of it. That means that if you're on the same network, potentially if you want a zone transfer, it does not go over without having to use a panic mode. It does absolutely mean that. You could, and I'm repeating it for the remote viewers, if you do a zone transfer inside a network, it is a way to enumerate a network without doing direct uh, sending traffic to it. That's true. And there's a similar result. Um, there's DNS enumeration is used anyway, where you go to a public server that has archived a lot of DNS queries and you find out just the name of public servers, uh, just from gathering it off the internet. There's a bunch of enumeration tools that use that. And another thing about DNS on the internet is if you have records of previous IP addresses, then you can find out when a company's moved, when companies got sold, you can find out the people are crooks because right now they have their own server, but they used to be on the same server as crooks and stuff. Um, you can find out that companies, you know, a lot of people will put up servers full of spam and malware and they get busted and they just put up another one full of spam and malware and move from one to another. And looking at the history will help you track that down. You can also catch criminals. They caught members of WorldSec and Anonymous this way by because they now run a server attacking people. But they, if you look at their previous servers that domain name is on, then you'll find other websites that just have their name and face and their dating profile and stuff because back then they weren't a criminal. And then they became a criminal and they did not carefully plan it and make a completely different identity and cut all the trails. Um, often there's a trail leading right back to when they were just a teenager playing war games and then they decided to be naughtier or naughtier until they're doing major crimes. And DNS history leads right back to them. Brian Krebs does this, a lot of people do this. That's only if they register to domain name Right, yeah. So I mean, that's why if you're like, the gesture apparently didn't do this. The gesture apparently decided to do crime and decided to make a completely separate identity and made sure that there was no trail from here back to the real one. So many, many people have been hunting for years and nobody can find it. Another real important thing is to have no friends. You have to not be on a team. You have to not have any partners because you can't trust anybody on the internet. This shouldn't take a genius to figure out how much do you really think that person in a chat room loves you and will go to jail for you? Not so much really. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Shared secret is an oxymoron. All right. I got some high clickers about this stuff and the zoom is already going. So the remote attendees can reach them. Uh, I got some sound too. Good. Let me log in. And, uh, my favorite should include DNS, chapter 3A, all right, make that bigger. All right. <coughs> Try to make it as big as possible. This nice room with the screen high enough. All right.
two Ericas apparently. Right? Yeah. I did. The first time I caught the hacking class in like 2009, she says they've had an open zone transfer, and I did it. By the second time I caught that class, it was gone. Somebody leaked it. I was not going to tell them for like a week so I could demonstrate it in the second class, but within a day of demonstrating it in the first class, it was magically fixed. But, well, well, you know, that's fine. That's a, that's a, a, you know, they're really quite good about security here. Our cybersecurity is one of the good parts of the college. There's a lot of this college that is amazingly dysfunctional, but Tim on the networks and cybersecurity really is very good. It's a very strange environment. There's very little supervision, workers, so you get a really uneven. Some people just do good work, other people do rotten work, and there's no management making it even. Anyway. I'll uh, wait a few more seconds and then go. Okay, looks like this is it. All right. So, which one of these leads to denial of service? All right, that's single point of failure, of course. That's why it is called fault tolerant. You have multiple uh, redundant systems, so a fault does not lead to a failure. A fault is when something breaks. A failure is when customers stop receiving service. And a fault tolerant system can have something break, but the customers continue to receive service because there are redundant systems. Anyway, which error exposes the whole network diagram? Okay, zone transfers expose the whole diagram. These leaking internal queries expose one address at a time, maybe not everything. All right. Which features should never be active on an SOA server? Sure. Okay, recursion is not necessary and uh, it should be turned off. Which server is a danger to others? Right, the open resolvers can be abused by people for denial of service attacks. So let me um, set up one of these and let's have records here. Okay. Eric, other, Erica. I'll find out who that is. Noel, I think that's a real name. And Kaz is a real name. So two of you are going to get your points. The other Erica is one of you folks, right? Yeah. So, so um, I'll get it later. Let me just save this. All right. Just don't, don't uh, forget to tell me before the end of class, or you may not get your points. All right. So I think we have time to carry on here. So, all right. Uh, another thing people do, of course, is run their services as root when it doesn't have to be. This is less common than it used to be, but still a lot of things run as root. One thing, exception, of course, is Apache. Apache is intended to run as root, and each connection starts a different process, and they're protected in other ways. But most servers, people run them as root just because they're too sloppy to configure permissions correctly. And of course, that's not a good idea. We were talking about this earlier. That's why you're not supposed to run Wireshark as root because it has vulnerabilities. And if you run a service with a vulnerability, someone can get a shell. And if you run it as root, they get a root shell. If you run it as low privileges, they get a low privilege shell. And then they have another barrier to escalate privileges, which will slow them down. All right. And let me uh, minimize that stuff. All right, and I've heard rumors that muting people might have some effect on that, or it doesn't seem to have much effect. Anyway, um, all right, 
Then, of course, there are bugs. Bind is the most popular server for DNS. It has been for a long time, and it just had a long series of vulnerabilities, which is true also of OpenSSH. Pretty much anything that's been around for 20 years was written long ago before people understood most security problems, and they had to go through many generations of making all the usual mistakes. The early stuff had trivial command injection vulnerabilities, then they had buffer overflows, then they had one problem after another as we evolved. There's just People only write software up to the traditions at that time, usually. And anyway, Bind had a many, many flaws, many, many vulnerabilities. Now, lately, like almost every major software in the last five years, I don't think they've had major vulnerabilities. You give you remote control, they just have minor ones that give you the ability to crash the server or something. Um, because, you know, people have gradually improved their standards of coding as the years pass. There are a lot of vulnerabilities. Here's one that allows you to have a denial of service. And here's one that uh, another, those are all denial of service. Sorry, these are all just denial of service. And those are 2012, 2013. Back in like 2008, 2009, they'd be remote code execution on the server through buffer overflows and stuff, and they patched that. So unless you're running really old versions, that's not too likely. Although there are ones. I know um, there were DHCP servers that were vulnerable to um, shell shock which was a command injection in bash. So it still happens sometimes, but it's not as common as it used to be. Anyway, uh, here's one in 2008 that would let you have another denial of service by crashing it. And this one here worked by having a long IP address, which would have some code in the middle. Uh, the very first version of, I think, Chrome that came out had a vulnerability like this. You could just save a web page and put a name that was like 100 characters long and cause a crash. Simple buffer overflow. Anyway, uh, source port randomization is a big deal. Um, this has a, is, I think, no longer that important. And that's why I changed the project so you're not working with the Kaminsky vulnerability so much. This was a huge vulnerability, made Dan Kaminsky famous, but it was patched in 2008 or shortly after 2008. And so there's almost no product in current use that still has this vulnerability. But the, um, the point is, when you ask a query of a DNS server, unfortunately, that query is not encrypted and it is not signed. So you send a query. When you get the reply, therefore, since it's not encrypted and not signed, you have no way to tell if the reply actually came from the server you were talking to. Since it's being sent over the internet, the query could have been redirected by the routers to anywhere, and the reply could have come from anywhere, and there's nothing in there to tell you that it's really the authentic reply. And this is appalling by modern standards, but it is the way the whole internet worked because the main concern in the early internet was just to make it fast enough to work at all. And the thought that someone would be maliciously modifying stuff to fool you was not considered a big issue. So what they did was they put a transaction ID in the query. So you have this 16-bit number to identify your, your, your request and the reply has to have the same value of that 16-bit ID. So they say an attacker that is not in the middle, able to view your query, will not know what to tell you. And that's true, but it turns out that guessing something at random that has 65,000 possibilities is not as hard as you would think if you're clever enough. And that's what Dan Kaminsky did. He found a way to guess 500 guesses at a time. And if you can guess 500 at a time, 65,000 becomes an achievable number before too long. Um, now, bind eight and nine didn't even randomize the transaction ID that were just sequential or something, which was also true of port numbers or of sequence numbers in TCP. So you didn't even, it was very easy to spoof that, yeah. Wasn't it also true that there was only like 10 possible values that was originally? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, something very simple. Although the port was always 53. For a long time, it used 53 as the source and the destination port for all DNS queries. So yeah, that's one issue. So nothing, the port was always the same and the transaction ID was not very enough. So you, nowadays, if you take a modern version of the server, the transaction ID is here and you see it. You send a query on 668, you get the reply on 668, the next one is 8480, and so on. Each one has a 16-bit number, and the reply matches it. So if some attacker that did not get to receive your query tries to forge it, they only have one chance in 65,000 of getting that number right. But if you can, um, so you have to trick someone into using your DNS server if you want to poison them. So what you do is you make them view a web page or an email or something with a link or an image that comes from your domain. So now when they try to draw the page and the page has some reference to yours, they will send a request to your authoritative server. They're looking for nsevil.com. So they'll go to your server saying, where's this uh, evil.com's IP address? 
So if you manage to get someone to view anything you send them, which is quite easy, then they're going to try to look up something on your machine. Now the way is to trick them into doing many queries against your machine because you're trying to guess that number. So what you can do is you can make it so it'll take many queries to resolve. You can have evil.com be a C name for another one. So it has to do a resolution on that one and the next one and the next one. You can chain it. So it will make many requests trying to pull up this image in an email or something. You can also use NS referral. You can have a startup authority go to something, which then delegates it to another server and another server and another server, so they keep on coming back over and over again to servers under your control. And this is a way to turn one link into many DNS queries. And the other thing that is very strange about DNS is if I'm looking for um, www.ccsf.edu, you can answer other questions in your response that I did not ask and the server will believe them. So you can tell me, here's where WW is, and here's where other stuff is, and here's where the SOA is while I'm at it. And it will just believe all that and put it in. Now, this is the kind of coding that was also true of mobile devices, like Android phones. Um, the mobile device management system that I talked about used um, SAML, Security Search and Markup Language, which you may have noticed is also what our Canvas system uses. And it is a way of moving a security search over a network. And until about five years ago, 11 of the 14 popular platforms for this service all had enormous vulnerabilities like this. You would have a signed record that says, here's my signature, proving that what I'm saying is true. And that would get processed by the first module and say, okay, it's true. Then it would pass on to the next module, which just believe like 10 assertions when only the first one is signed because the authentication module was separate from the enforcement module. And it's the same thing here. You can come in answering the question that was asked, and then if there's more information, we'll just put all that in the database too. Here's all this information. It sort of believes rumors. So that's the trick. This is the protocol design weakness. You have the transaction ID is only 16 bits, and um, the other numbers are almost always known. You can guess what the question is, especially if you control it by making someone click on a link on your web page or load your web page, and the IP addresses and the ports are not secret, unfortunately. So the first reply reply that it has these properties will be believed by the server and put in the cache for perhaps a day. So I can put the wrong address for something like Yahoo or Google in a DNS cache. And all those people will now go to the wrong page. <coughs> That's the game. So the attacker is up here. You somehow you ask you you get someone to ask a question and you send false answers from the attacker trying to get the right match. And that's the game. Um, if you can trick it into believing I'm the authoritative response, I can change the number for Yahoo. And the Kaminsky attack is here. I'm not going to go through it in great detail, but the point is he sent it to aaa.paypal.com on some web page. And then with a whole series of queries, they're going here, and the attacker is immediately sending fake responses to this question. And when they happen to get lucky, if you get that 16 bit value correct, then they poison a central shared server, like one of the Comcast DNS servers. Now all the Comcast customers in that region will all get the wrong answer as long as you keep on poisoning. And so uh, this means you can reroute traffic globally the same way they're doing with uh, putting malware in the, in the routers. Um, all right. And that's the game there. And you can remember it for days. You can set the cash value in your response to be very long. So it will continue to have the wrong value for a really long time. That's why it's really quite important. And there's many ways to do it. Uh, many ways to trick. All you have to do is have any way to make the target do a DNS resolution, and, and that's very easy. Um, so that's one weakness. That one has now been patched. By the way, the simple way of patching it is to just make the source port random. That gives you another 16 bits of randomness, which makes it 65,000 more difficult to exploit, and that's what the short-term fix was. That's what happened in server 2008 with servers pack two. They just randomized the source port, and now the source port and the TXID both had to match. So now it was very difficult for someone to exploit this at a distance. However, you can still exploit it if you're in the middle. This is a privileged position attack. And here, almost every protocol um, is susceptible to this unless they have a trusted third party like HTTPS. If I can see the query, then I have all the information necessary to forge the evil response. And there's really nothing you can do about that in the absence of a protocol like HTTPS. And this, to solve this kind of problem, we should really be doing DNS over HTTPS. And that is growing in popularity, but it still doesn't have convenient clients. And there's a couple of projects where you set it up, but nobody's using it by default yet, except Burp uses it by default. And then, of course, this one, you have a query which can have 
a small query and a large response. And since it's all done over UDP, there's no handshake. So it does not have any way to know if I put the wrong from address. So all the responses are going to my target instead of to me. If it was using TCP, you couldn't do that because you'd have to answer the handshake to make the connection. But if it's UDP, it has no way to tell. And that's a common DOS amplification attack. All right. So down to here, there's another set of cahoots. And I can close that one and go to 3B. Okay. Good. Looks like things are still connected and such. seconds but I think 18 is about the right number all right okay so what weakness makes it more dangerous when you get hacked In privileged mode, of course, you've lost one barrier of security, one layer of defense. Which one makes it easier to poison the cash? Okay, if your source port is fixed, then it's easy. All you have to guess is the TXID. So which one will cause all the users of your server to see fake websites? <laughs> yep, that's the point. Cache poisoning on the server. All right, which one exposes information but does no immediate harm? That's zone transfer is information disclosure. All right. Which one lowers availability but does not affect confidentiality or integrity? Okay, that's denial of service. And here's a similar one. Which one lowers integrity but does not affect confidentiality or availability? That's cash poisoning. The point is the data is wrong. It has been changed by an unauthorized party. It's not that the server is down or that you found a secret. You have made unauthorized modification and that's a failure of integrity. And these are the three big security concepts. And if you take the CISSP, you see how this all came about from people trying to figure out what computer security was. At first, the only thing they thought of was confidentiality. And then they discovered that integrity and availability were necessary too as they went through various models, uh, perfecting what was really necessary to make computers more reliable. So I've got more people to record here. Rich sounds like a real name. And Kaz is a real name. And N Horner might be a real name too. So I think, and I know who you are, I'll find out. So um, I think that's it. I'll go ahead and help anybody that wants to work here in the lab. Um, and you've got several projects to do. Maybe don't meet again for several weeks. So. Uh, 
Anybody got any questions? Well, I'll stop the share and go down to the lab. And let me...